All right, so I'm going to preach a sermon this morning. It's tied in with salvation. Now, at, at, at Word of Truth Baptist Church, we believe in what's known as easy believism. Believe salvation is very easy. All you have to do to be saved is believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved now. The Bible says in Acts 16, it's a free gift. It has nothing to do with our works. It's very clear. It's very evident. Yet man wants to come along, other religions and denominations and people just want to make things really confusing. And they're always trying to find ways to back in works, some form of works to make sure that, you know, that, well, you know, you, you believe you get saved, but if you don't do the works and you can't keep your salvation and, and all these various ways to try to insert their works and pervert the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Because the gospel of Christ is very plain and very clear and very simple. And, it, and, it's, and it's, it's great news. It's good news. God loves us. And, and he demonstrates how much he loves us and that you know, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Amen. He paid the punishment. He did it all. He gets all the glory. It has nothing to do with us. It couldn't be easier to understand. And what goes hand in hand with that understanding is that we have eternal life. It lasts forever. Once you're saved, you are always saved. You're saved forever. It's eternal life. But there's a question that comes up, and that the question is the title of my sermon, Does Every Believer Automatically Have Good Works? Because what people will try to tell you is that, well, you're saved by grace, but then how do you know if someone's saved? Well, are they doing good works? Do they have the good works to follow? Or other people will say, see, they're not living right, so they must not be saved. And they, they have this type of an attitude. So we're going to look at some scripture this morning. And Romans 4 is a perfect place. We start there because we could actually answer this question really, really quickly. So we started off in Romans 4. And if you're not, you know, this is a passage I would recommend memorizing. We've already had this as a memory verse in, in this church. But um, there is a lot of great, if you're giving the gospel to someone, you know, this might not be part of what's known as the Romans road. But I would include this, and I do include this very often times when I give the gospel to people, if they're hung up on some types of works aspect. Because it tells you, I mean, it goes to, it talks about how Abraham believed God, David believed God. And I want to focus in there. Look at verse number four here in Romans chapter four. The Bible says, now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. He's saying if you work for something, that is not grace. Just by definition, that can't be grace. Grace is something that's undeserved. It's something that's unmerited. It's something that's not worked for. It's something that's just given to you for free. That's not grace. That's debt. When you work for something and someone compensates you for that work, they owe that to you. They're indebted to you for the work that you've done. God is not indebted to us no matter how many good works we do. He does not owe us salvation. No amount of good works is going to save our souls. It's too costly. It's too high of a price. We can't do it, which is why it is of grace. But look at verse number five here. Bible says, but to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So what we have here, and this is, this is what people want to say, oh, well, it's impossible because they want to quote James chapter 2 and they say, well, faith without works is dead, right? So you can't be saved if you're not doing works. That's what, that's what they want to say. Even though the passage doesn't say you're not saved if you don't have good works. It literally just says faith without works is dead, which is a very true statement. Your faith can die, but it doesn't mean your eternal life goes away. But we do have a scenario here. What, is there a scenario where you have someone who doesn't do good works, but they believe? Is that even possible? According to Romans 4, 5, it is, because it says, but to him that worketh not, but believeth. So is it possible? Yes, it is. Is it possible for someone to be a believer and not do good works? Yes, it is. Now, if we want to know, it's important to try to understand if someone's saved, right? It's something that we do want to try to figure out. Because if they're not saved, we want to try to get them saved. So what's the number one way that we try to figure out if someone's saved? We ask them what they believe. If salvation is based on what you believe, then if you want to know if someone's saved or not, you ask them, hey, what do you have to do to be saved? And you get to the heart of the issue. That's all we can do. Look, we can't see their hearts, 
but God can. We can see some of their actions, but we still can't see their heart. I'm a perfect living example of this. Why well, when people, you know, sometimes, and you know, people get screwed up on this. I believe even some people who legitimately got saved have gotten a little turned around because maybe they grew up in a Christian home and they get, they get, they get mixed up in this whole repent of your sins thing and they think that like, oh, well, I never smoked or drank or did all this other stuff after I got saved. So that just, I mean, then if you do those things then you're not saved, right? And people have these different experiences. Well, you know what my experience was? I got saved when I was 20 years old and then I drank and smoked and fornicated and did drugs and did other things, you know, like, does that mean I wasn't saved? Well, you know what? I put my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I called on the name of God and I asked him to save me in faith. So you're going to tell me I wasn't saved? Because I know that I was saved. Now, my, if you were to look at my outward man, not the inward man, we we'll get into that in a little bit. If you looked at my outward man, you might say, yeah, he's not saved. Now, that might, not be a bad, that might not be a bad assumption because if your goal is to get people saved, there's nothing wrong with trying to get somebody, if you, if you think maybe someone's not saved, trying to give them the gospel. But if someone, and look, no one approached me and tried to give me the gospel. But if someone did, I would have given them the right answer because I was saved. But the way that we understand is we look at you and say, hey, this person's living a reckless life and everything else. They're probably not saved. I mean, odds are they're probably not. But odds are even the person doing good works is probably not saved. Because great is the way and broad is the way that leads to destruction, right? And many there be which go in there at, because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. So if you're just going off statistics, most people are going to hell. And that's just a fact. But the way that we understand if someone's saved or not is we ask them, it's, you know, what comes out of their mouth is going to reflect what's in their heart. Now, can people lie? Yeah, they could lie. But, it, I mean, they're not helping themselves at all if they lie. They might lie to you, but that's not going to hurt you. They're the ones that wouldn't be saved, not you, you know what I mean? So it's, it's um, we, we strictly can go off of what a person confesses with their mouth because that's supposed to reflect what's in their heart. Turn, if you would, to Philippians chapter 1. But, I mean, we, we're, we're going to get to examples in a little bit, but, I mean, just, just a real simple one, too. You know, people say, well, every believer, you know, if you're, not, if you're saved, then you must be doing, you have to be doing at least some good works. And here's, here's another thing I've heard a lot is people say, well, I believe in a gospel that changes. Has anyone heard that before? A gospel that changes. I believe in a gospel. You know what? I believe in a gospel that changes, too. I do, but what I mean by that isn't necessarily the same what they believe by that because the gospel does change when you are born again. You have a new, a new creature inside of you. You are born again. That is true. And I think this is where they extrapolate and go a little bit too far with, the, with their thinking is that, yes, we do have a new creature that's born and you are changed. You're born of God when you believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And... I would go as far as to say, usually and probably almost all the time, there will be good works followed up. There will be people, do, you know, there, there is, because there's that new desire, because there's a des the spirit that's going to drive you to do good. But the point of the sermon is to explain that you cannot just say that every single believer will always automatically just have good works because it's not true. I'm going to prove it from Scripture. Now, we are changed. Philippians 1, verse 6 says, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ, even as it is meet for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, and as much as both of my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, ye are all partakers of my grace. The, um, the work that God has begun in us, when we got saved, he began to work in us. There's a new man born. There's a new creature born inside of you. And he will perform that work until the day of Christ, what that means is that that's when our salvation is going to be completed. Now, I don't mean that it's incomplete in the sense that you could lose your salvation somehow and you have to keep working for it. No. Complete just means that body, soul, and spirit all completely saved. Because right now, when you get saved, you still have this sinful flesh. Right. Our salvation isn't 
whole or complete. We get our new bodies when Jesus Christ comes back at the day of the Lord Jesus. Body, soul, spirit, all whole, complete. Salvation is complete at that point in, in that sense, right? Obviously, you're saved the moment you believe, but the, the, the end result is, is with your flesh being saved as well happens at the day of Jesus Christ. So he which hath begun a good work in you, he began it when he gave you the new spirit. He's going to finish it when you get your new body. That's what this verse is saying here. It's very clear about that as well. Turn, if you would, to Matthew chapter 7. But what we see there too is who is performing a good work there? God is, right? He who hath begun a good work in you will perform it. That's not you performing the good work. That's God performing a good work in you. So that's not saying that you know, a believer is automatically going to have good works. That's talking about God's work in you, not your good works that you do outwardly. So a lot of people will turn to or use, they don't turn to because they usually don't know the Bible well enough, but they hear this preached. And it is, again, just a side note, this is why it's so important for you to read your own Bible. Come to church, hear preaching, but read the Bible on your own because, you, you know, I'm not perfect for one. And you need to be taking a responsibility on yourself to know what the Bible says, to know if you are being deceived or not. Because there are a lot of deceivers out there. And one of the things that people are deceived about is they say, oh, well, we can know if someone's saved based on their fruit. Right? We say, and we hear that a lot. And what they mean by fruit is, are they doing good works? So it's back to this whole thing of, is someone saved? Well, let's look at their works. As if the works is what got them saved, right? I mean, it would make sense. If works got us saved, then yeah, I'd be looking at the works. That would make sense. But if works doesn't get you saved, then why are you looking at the works to see if someone is saved? Belief is what saves. Let's check their belief. But look at Matthew 7, because this is what, where this teaching comes from. It just literally just comes from teachers that are manipulating the Bible and not pre preaching it truthfully in the way that, it's, that it just simply says in the plain text. It's easy for someone to come along to quote a couple of verses and to go on talking and talking and talking for a long time and for people to just eat that up and just say, oh, well, it came from the Bible. I heard him use the Bible and this is what he's saying and that's true and people just go along and believe that. And they say, see, we're supposed to judge people by their fruits. Well, where they're pulling that from is from Matthew chapter 7. Okay, and we're going to look at it in context and see what that's talking about. Let's start reading here. And let's start reading in verse 16. Because that's probably where if people want to manipulate the Bible would start. Verse 16. Ye shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire. Wherefore, by their fruits ye shall know them. And then it follows up with, Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. But he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name have cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. So what they say is, see, it says we're going to know them by their fruits. We're going to, you know, this is how we know. We look at them and it says a good tree can't bring forth evil fruit, an evil fruit tree can't bring forth good fruit. And what they just automatically assume is that's their works. So this is how we know if somebody's saved. But is this how we know if somebody's saved? What is this talking about? Look at verse 15, because when we get the context of verse 15, we understand exactly what Jesus is teaching here. Verse 15 says, Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. Ye shall know them by their fruits. So what is the fruit going to let you know? False prophet. Now, is every person in the world a prophet? Are they either a, a, a false prophet or a good prophet? Is everybody a prophet? No. So can we apply this to just every, is this a believer or an unbeliever? No, that's not what he's talking about. 
He's talking about a tree. He's equating a prophet to being a tree. Why? Because a prophet or a preacher is going to be someone who has followers, someone who's bringing forth other people to follow them. And typically, when you have a prophet, the people that follow them are going to be kind of like that person, right? Because that's, that's what they're doing. They're leading people a certain direction, and their followers are going to be like them. They're going to reflect the false pro or the, the prophet, right? Whether false or true. The people, generally speaking, will reflect that. Because the prophet is the tree, and all the followers are the fruit. And that's how you're, you're judging if someone's a false prophet or a true prophet. You could judge the fruit. This is how you know, you know, when someone's going out and they've got a ministry and they're, they're winning people to Christ, you want to judge the fruit or the, the, the worthiness of the prophet, talk to the people who are getting saved. Do they have the right gospel? Do they believe on the Lord Jesus? You know, is that right? Well, we know that according to this scripture, you know, a false prophet can't get people saved because a bad tree doesn't bring forth good fruit. If someone's got a false gospel, they're not going to be giving people saved with the right gospel. It's just not going to happen. This is what this, this verse is, is talking about in context. It's very clear. But you have to be reading your Bible. You have to be reading it in context and watch out, especially, look, if you go to other churches, you know, and you hear just one or, because I've heard this almost my entire life in other churches outside of, you know, Faithful Word Baptist Church where I went for, for a really long time. It, the, almost every other, even, even decent churches, almost every time it's like you hear a couple of verses and then a lot of talking. And this is, this is one of the reasons why we start off reading an entire chapter for our text verse and in in, you know, for a sermon is because get it in context. It's important to understand the context of what's being preached. We read Romans 4. You know, I, I was focusing in on verses 4 and 5 of Romans 4. But when you get all of Romans 4, you're really getting the full context of what that chapter is talking about. And then you could know, hey, is pastor yanking this out of context just to fit his own agenda or fit his own doctrine, whatever he wants to prop up? Or does it actually fit in with what everything else is being spoken about in that chapter? And it ought to be lining up. But see, not everyone's going to do that for you and, and give you the context and everything. And we can't, for sake of time, give you context on every single, you know, every point that I have in my outline. I can't give you, we can't just read all of these chapters all the way through, which is why you need to know it for yourself. You need to be reading the Bible. After you hear a message, go home and then read, you know, take notes. We've got the notes section on the back of our bulletin. Write down the references that are being used and go look them up and read them in context for yourself when you go home and make sure that what you're being told is true. And that's, that's a way that you need to be able to judge. Now turn, if you would, to Galatians chapter 5. Galatians chapter 5. So when you call someone out on the, on the you know, oh, you're going to know them by their fruits, you say, it's talking about false prophets. They say, oh, yeah, but what about the fruit of the Spirit? Right? That's, that's like, in my experience, the, the, the very next thing. Well, I'm talking about the fruit of the Spirit. Right? And people want to say, like people like me or Pastor Anderson or Pastor Man, you know, you guys aren't saved because you're so hateful and you're not loving and all this other stuff. And, they, you know, and they just want to throw things at you, which isn't true anyways. Anyone who knows me or knows him, you know, we're not just like these hateful people just hate, hate, hate. You know, like every day I wake up and I'm just hating and I go to church and I'm hating and I go, you know, it's like, no. The Bible says there's a time to love and a time to hate. And that's a fact. There are some things that we're supposed to hate. But does that just make me a hateful person? Well, to some people, I guess it does. But, you know, you judge for yourself, okay? And you already have because you're, you're, all, you're sitting here this morning. And I don't think there's anyone who hasn't heard um, a lot of the accusations. And if you haven't, don't worry about it. But um, Galatians chapter 5. We're going to look at uh, Galatians 5. Talk about the fruit of the Spirit, okay? Which by the way, is not exactly the same as the fruit of a Christian or a fruit of a person. It's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit has its fruit. It's what's reproduced from the Holy Spirit. We as people, as human beings, you know, I mean, physically, we reproduce with other children, right? My wife and I, 
we have reproduced, we have brought forth fruit, which the Bible talks about bearing fruit and a womb that bears fruit. It's talking about having children. It's talking about reproduction, right? So when we pr reproduce ourselves, it's in other people. That's our fruit. That's what we're producing. We can't bring forth, you know, when my wife and I reproduce, we're not going to bring forth a sheep or an ox or an animal, right? It's, it's going to be another human being. It's after our kind. The false prophet brings forth after his kind. The right prophet brings forth after his kind. People bring forth after their kind. And you know what? The Holy Spirit brings forth after its kind. Galatians 5, look at verse number 13. The Bible says, For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. Now, we have been called unto liberty. Why? Because the gospel brings liberty. It brings freedom from the curse of the law. Because as sinners, we deserve a punishment through the law. But God gives us liberty, freedom. We've, we've been freed from that bondage. We have salvation. We have eternal life. But then he follows up and says, only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. Because you have this liberty, he's saying, don't use that. Don't abuse your liberty by just saying, well, now I'm going to go off and live a wicked life, live a sinful life, and do whatever my flesh wants to do. Hey, because I'm free. Now, people will tell you, oh, well, if you're, if you're really saved, you wouldn't go off and do these things. If that were the case, if, some, if you were really saved, you wouldn't go off and continue in the flesh. Really? Then why did, why did it seem fit to even say, don't use liberty for an occasion of the flesh, if it's not even possible to begin with? Are you following what I'm saying here? Because you know, people try to tell you that you're, you wouldn't ever do those things. if you, you know, When I got saved, I quit drinking, I quit smoking, I quit all this, I quit cursing everything, just day one. And you know what those people are? Big fat liars. Proud, arrogant liars that want to put the glory on themselves that overnight I was instantly changed and I was just this new man and I was super Christian just at day one. Liar, hypocrite, it doesn't take, it, 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 nobody changes that quick overnight. I haven't met one, at least not one that had the right gospel. People want to tell you you got to turn from all your sins and turn from your work. Those are the people that want to puff themselves up. No, why? Because we still have this flesh. When you get saved, you do have that change. You do have that new creature, but you still have the old man too. It wouldn't even make sense for this to be in the Bible saying don't use your liberty for an occasion to the flesh if it wasn't possible. But it is possible. It is possible to use your liberty, to use your freedom. It's possible for me to go off and just commit every sin in the book and still go to heaven because I've been set free, because I have liberty, because Christ paid the debt that I owe. I'm not paying for it. I never did pay for it. He paid it in full. I can, can use my liberty as a case of flesh. But should I do that? Of course not. Absolutely not, but it is possible. It is not impossible. Of course it's possible to abuse your liberty. Let's keep reading here, verse number 14. For all the law is fulfilled in one word, even in this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. But if ye bite and devour one another, take heed that ye be not consumed one of another. This I say then, walk in the spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So obviously he's giving more advice here now on how not to abuse your liberty. On walking in the spirit. Hey, if you were walking in the spirit, he said, you're not going to, you're not going to fulfill the lust of the flesh. The things that you shouldn't be doing, you won't be doing those if you're walking in the spirit. Verse 17, for the flesh lusteth against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other so that you cannot do the things that ye would. And that word would just means what you'd want to do, right? The inward man wants to do good. But the flesh wants you to do evil. So there's a battle going on every day of your mortal life on this earth. Because the flesh wants you to do bad and the spirit wants you to do good. Pretty simple. Verse 18. But if ye be led of the spirit, ye are not under the law. Now, 
the wording is very important. Verse 16 said, walk in the spirit. Verse 18 says, if you be led in the spirit. And then in verse 25, we're going to see, it says, um, living in the spirit. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. Now, the wording is very important because this is why I think where a lot of confusion comes from. So he says, if you be led of the spirit, you're not under the law. Let's keep reading verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. All these various sins, all kinds of different sins are listed out here. He says, of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. This is a passage that people want to tell you to say, see, you know, because not every sin is mentioned, but it's saying, okay, if you're a, and, but see what they want to do is only pick out certain sins because they don't, like, there's a lot of sins lifted, listed here. And they'll tell you, well, if you're still a drunk, then you never got saved. Why? Well, the Bible says that they which commit such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So you can't be saved because you're a drunk. Keep your finger here in Galatians 5. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter number 6. And we're going to compare Scripture with Scripture. Because in 1 Corinthians 6, guess what? We're going to see another list of sins that is very, 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 very similar to the one that we just let, read here. And a very, very, very similar statement is made about people who commit those sins. But we're going to get a little bit of extra understanding. And when you're reading the whole Bible, you should be able to put these things together. And I'm here to help you put those things together, but look it up for yourselves and see. And write these notes down. Take a look at it when people confuse you with this stuff. Because it's easy to take Galatians 5.21 and just say, see? See, if you're doing this sin and this sin and this sin, you're not going to heaven. You're not going to hear. It's easy to take that one verse. But let's understand it because if that's true, if, if it's really just saying if you do this stuff, then you're not saved, then you have contradictions all over the place in the Bible. Right. Let's try to understand what he's talking about here. And we are going to continue reading, by the way, in Galatians 5. We're going to read the rest of this and get that explanation because um, that's also important. But I also, I first wanted to stop here and go to 1 Corinthians 6. Look at verse number 9. The Bible says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So again, talking about inheriting the kingdom of God, well, you're unrighteous. What does that mean? Well, you're a sinner, right? So you're a sinner, you're not inheriting the kingdom of God. Well, guess what? We're all sinners. What is he referring to when he says unrighteous? Who is he referring to when he says, They which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 9, be not deceived. Look at neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves of mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. Sounds very familiar, doesn't it? Doesn't it? You go back on your own time and just compare which sins, you know, it doesn't matter. There's a lot that's covered on both ends of the spectrum. Saying basically the same thing. But here's the key in how this is followed up in 1 Corinthians 6. Look at verse 11. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So you have committed these things. It says, look, if you committed these things, you're not going to heaven. That's what he, he just said that. Like, you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God if you're a drunkard or all this other stuff. Well, guess what? If you've already done the things, then that's what you are. If you've already been a drunk, then you're a drunk. If you've already told a lie, then you're a liar. If you've already killed someone, then you're a murderer. Right? But how is it that this can even make sense is because once you get saved, you're washed, you're sanctified. God doesn't look at you that way anymore. You are no longer a murderer or a thief or a drunk or any of those things because Jesus has cleansed you from all of that so that you are no longer that person. Even though you have done those things, 
the spirit, and we're going to get to this point too. There's a difference between your spirit and your flesh. And it's your, your spirit does not sin. And that's proven in 1 John 3. I'm going to get to that at the end of the sermon. The spirit doesn't sin. But the flesh does. The spirit is what's born of God. That is the new man. That is the new creature. And you've been washed and regenerated. So he says, um, let's go back to Galatians 5 because I just wanted to point that out to you when we see that. Oh, wait. Hold on a second. Verse 12. I, I, verse 12 in 1 Corinthians 6. All things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of enemy of any. And you have to ask yourself, does all mean all? Are all things lawful unto Paul or not? Are all things lawful unto you or not? The Bible says all things are lawful unto me, but all things are not expedient. What does that mean? I can do all things. You can, you can sin or not sin. Either way, you're saved, you're washed, you're regenerated. But it's not good. It's not expedient. It's not what you should be doing. It's not going to help you. There's still going to be, you're still going to be reaping what you sow in this life. But your soul is saved. Amen. You are washed. Same thing with using your, you know, abusing your liberty in Christ. Let's go back to Galatians 5 now. Galatians 5, we're going to keep, pick up reading here in verse 22, because verse 22 is where it goes into the fruit of the Spirit. So we saw the works of the flesh. It lists off all these various works of the flesh. And it says, hey, if you, you, know, if you have these things, you're going to hell. You don't, you're not getting the, you, you are not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 22 in Galatians 5 says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ's have crucified the flesh, with the affections and lusts. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, envying one another. So if you're walking in the Spirit, this fruit will come forth when you're walking in the Spirit. You can have the Spirit and not walk in the Spirit. So when you're looking at someone, this is why you can't just judge someone off their works. This is why you can't just assume they'll automatically have the good works because they can have the Spirit. But if you're walking in the flesh, what you're going to see is the fruit of the flesh, which is going to be all those sins. But if you're walking in the Spirit, then you can see the fruit of the Spirit. And only then. But you have to choose we have the will to choose. Are we going to walk in the flesh or are we going to walk in the spirit? So is it possible for a person to get saved, to have the spirit, and then choose to walk in the flesh? Yes, it is. I'm living proof of that. Of course it is. And at various times, look, just because someone might choose to walk in the flesh more than someone else, does anyone in here not ever walk in the flesh? Is anyone bold enough to make that statement to say, I am in the spirit 24 hours a day, seven days a week. I'm always walking in the spirit. I am just abounding and outpouring the fruit of the spirit all the time. Of course not. So then where do you draw the line? And people want to draw this line of, well, what's well, this sin and this sin? Well, what about your sin? Nobody's walking in the spirit all the time. If someone walks in the flesh longer, doesn't make them unsaved. Living, in this passage, living in the Spirit equals being saved. Walking in the Spirit is doing the works. Right. And we have to have that understanding to, to make any sense of this passage whatsoever. Flip back, if you would, to Romans chapter 5. I'll try to be, speed things up a little bit. Yeah. One more example, we're going to go real quickly through Romans 5 and 6. Because I just want to prove to you that it's not automatic to have good works. I want to prove that, that you know, people can be saved because they have the Spirit and you don't always see that in them. It's wrong to be walking in the flesh. Okay, don't misquote me. Of course it's wrong. And we're going to see this in Romans chapter 5. But it's very, very clear in Romans 5 and 6. That God's grace covers everything and it covers all sin of all time. 
And if I continue to sin, guess what? God's grace covers my sin every single time I sin. Every single time, no matter what my sin is. If I commit murder, guess what? Jesus Christ already paid for that murder. Amen. He already did it. It's already taken care of. Grace is going to abound over that sin. Amen. The more I sin, the more grace abounds. And Romans 5 explains that. Look at Romans 5, verse number 20. Romans 5, 20. And again, great passage. Get the whole thing in context later on. Talks about Adam and Jesus and, you know, one man's sin. You know, sin is brought into the world by one man and, and and uh, salvation was brought by one man. Look at verse number 20, though, is where we're going to start reading. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. The more laws there are, the more offenses there are. The more things there are that are wrong, the more things that people are going to be doing that's against the law, right? And where the, when the law entered, hey, the offense abounded. But where sin abounded, look at this, grace did much more abound. Anywhere you see sin abounding, grace much more abounded and covered all of that sin. That as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. Grace had to cover all the sins. It has to. Or else, how could you be saved? It covers all of them. But then Romans 6, after he just gets done saying, look, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. The natural thing is, well, then why shouldn't I just keep on sinning, right? Right? Let's just have more grace. Let's have a grace fest by going out and committing all this sin, right? Let, let's make grace abound. Let's just get all the grace we can get by getting in as much sin as we can get. <laughs> what a foolish philosophy, right? But look what he says in Romans 6, 1. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Well, should we do that? Should we just go off and sin? God forbid. Of course not. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer there? And look, and, and I didn't really cover this that much, but our flesh was mortified. It was nailed to the cross. When we got saved, we died to our flesh, spiritually speaking. But we're still in the flesh today. Your spirit died to the flesh. So yeah, look, your spirit died to the flesh. How, why should we even live any longer therein anymore? Because that's gone. We shouldn't do those things. Look at verse number three. And I want you to pay attention to this as we go through Romans 6. Notice the usage of the word should in the passage. We use Acts 16 a lot when we, give, when we talk about salvation because it says, what must I do to be saved? Must is have to, requirement. What must I do? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. What should I do? Is should the same as must? No. Of course not. Should is just, what are you supposed to do? What should you be doing? Pay attention to the use of the word should. So he says, God forbid, verse 2, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer there? And know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Notice it doesn't say that everyone who's saved will automatically walk in newness of life. No, we should walk in newness of life. Do we have newness of life? Yes, but we should walk in that newness of life. Verse number five, for if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, and if you're saved, you have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Now, shall and should are different, especially, you know, shall is not the same as should. Shall is something that is going to happen for sure. Right. We see shall. Whosoever called upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And here it's, if you've been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. So in the light, we're, if you're saved, you are going to be. It is a, a sure thing in the likeness of Jesus Christ's resurrection. You are saved. You're going to have that second resurrection. Amen. Verse number six. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Should not. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. And again, shall means it is going to happen. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dieth no more, death hath no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
Let not sin, therefore, reign or have control, rule in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lusts thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. We have the choice to allow sin to take over, to reign in our bodies. We have the choice to yield our bodies to sin. That's why he's telling us not to do it. We have that choice. But nowhere does it say we are not saved if we yield our members to sin. It never says that one time. Nowhere. Well, I just don't think that a, believe, a, a, a saved person would ever, do, would ever get drunk. The Bible never says that. You can think that all you want, but that's not biblical. That's not what the Scripture teaches. The Scripture is teaching the exact opposite here. It's saying, hey, don't let it rain. Don't walk in the flesh. Walk in the spirit. Choose to do these things because you have that choice. I'll just read this for you. In, in Ephesians 2, of course, we use Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 a lot for, for giving someone saved. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is a gift of God, not of works as any man should boast. Verse 10 says, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. He said, hey, we were created under good works. That's why, we, you know, God gave you a new creature. You should walk in them. You should do the good works. That's what God wants you to do. That's God's will for your life. But it's still your decision, and it doesn't affect your salvation at all. The salvation was covered by Jesus Christ. Amen. And your acceptance of that free gift paid the whole way. Turn, if you would, to 1 John. I told you we get to 1 John. 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3 might be um, seen as a difficult passage to understand for some, and I, and I could understand why it would be. Um, I think it's a great passage. I mean, all, all, all of God's Word is great, obviously. But I think one of the reasons why people have a problem with it is because of all of the bad teachings that are out there. And, and the lack of comprehension of the new man and the new spirit versus the old flesh. And people trying to merge the two together of saying that, you know, oh, if you're doing this sin, you're not saved and all this other stuff. And it, and it confuses matters. It complicates the issue. If you're saved, you were born again. You're born of the seed of God. You have that spirit dwelling in you right now. And we're going we're gonna to see what 1 John chapter 3 says. Look at verse number 2. Oh, we might as well start with verse number one. Verse number one, Behold, what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. He said, wow, what, what, what manner of love, what greatness that we could even be called a son of God. Amen. We're born into God's family. That's great news, right? And, and he's going to keep following up with this concept of being a son of God. Look at verse number two. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Again, perfectly coincides with passages we've already talked about, the resurrection. We're going to be in the likeness of Jesus Christ when we get our new bodies. Right now, we don't know exactly what that's going to be like. But when we see him, we, you know, we shall be like him. We shall see him as he is. As a son of God, then our flesh will be changed and be conformed to verse number three. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not, Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. So right away you get this verse here in verse 6 where you start thinking like, well, wait a minute. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. And you say, well, have you sinned? Do you sin? So I sin. Does that mean I'm not abiding in Christ? Well, let's keep reading here. because And it says, whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither known him. Do you sin? Does that mean you don't know Jesus? We're going to see what he's referring to, what, who you are in this passage. Because he's talking about being a son of God. 
Our flesh is not a son of God. Our spirit is. Our spirit is the new creature. Our spirit's what's born again. Let's keep reading. Little children, verse 7, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. He that committeth sin is of the devil, for the devil sinneth from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. For his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. In this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. So, very, very clearly stating, if you're born of God, it says, whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin. Does someone who's born of God commit sin? No, not according to this passage. It says, why? Why does, why does whosoever born of God not commit sin? Because his seed remaineth in him. And he cannot sin because he is born of God. The seed comes from God. It comes literally from God's word. The word of Lord is planted in your heart. And that's what brings forth the life. So that life that is in you is literally born of God, which is why we can be called a son of God. So the spirit, and that's why the Bible says, if you walk in the spirit, you won't fulfill the lusts of the flesh because your spirit cannot sin. It does not sin. Your spirit is born of God. Your spirit is what drives you to do what's good. And that's why when you're walking in the spirit, you won't do any sin because the spirit doesn't ever sin. It's born of God. That's what this passage is teaching us. So we don't have to worry and say, well, wait a minute. I sin." Yeah, you sin because you still have the flesh. But when you're walking in the spirit, you never sin. And that's also why if in the flesh you commit one of these sins where he says, you know, if you commit these sins, you cannot inherit the kingdom of God. You did not commit those sins in the spirit. When your body passes away, your flesh stays here. What's left? Your soul and your spirit. Does your spirit have, a, a, is your spirit a fornicator or a drunk or any of those things? No. No. That's why you go to heaven. That's why you can inherit the kingdom of God still because that spirit. Because the spirit is born of God. The flesh is not. Those that aren't born again don't have that regenerated spirit. So they don't inherit the kingdom of God. All they have is their drunkenness, fornication, lies, whatever, all the things that could be listed off in those lists. That's what they have. So they don't inherit the kingdom of God. It's not a difficult concept. I mean, I could, like I said, I could see where, well, what is this even talking about? He starts off talking about being a son of God. We have so much other scripture, thank God, that tell, tell us about the dichotomy between the spirit and the flesh, walking in the spirit, not walking in the flesh, and all these other things. But when you understand that, it helps you to understand why, you know, if someone's not walking in the spirit, it doesn't mean they're not saved. It doesn't mean the spirit's not there. They're not showing anyone. It's not being fruitful. It's not helping anybody when you're not walking in the spirit. And you can understand why someone would say, like, well, are you even saved? If you're never walking in the Spirit. But we can't say for sure that someone's not saved because they're not walking in the Spirit, because everyone has a choice. And this is proven even further at the judgment seat of Christ. I have a lot of scripture here. I'm not going to go through all of this. But... Um, Actually, this is even more important than the, the last stuff I have. So let's turn, if you would, really quickly to um, turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians 3. I'm going to wrap things up here. I'm going to read from 2 Corinthians chapter 5. You turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians 5.1 says, For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. It's eternal. It's forever. right? We have, we have a house in heaven. For in this we groan, earnestly desiring to be clothed upon with our house, which is from heaven. If so be that being clothed, we shall not be found naked. For we that are in this tabernacle do groan, being burdened. Not for that we would be unclothed, but clothed upon that mortality might be swallowed up of life. 
Now he that hath wrought us for the selfsame thing is God, who also hath given unto us the earnest of the Spirit. The earnest means it's a down payment. It's that it's an earnest money. Like you put earnest money on a house. It's that down payment of the Spirit. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. As long as we're in this earth and in this fleshly body, we're absent from God. We have the Spirit. He's given us that, that earnest of the Spirit. But we're absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident in saying, willing rather to be absent from the body and be present with the Lord. Hey, it's going to be a lot better when we're not in this flesh anymore and we're with God. Amen? I mean, we've got, we've got problems. We've got, you know... Other, you know, the fleshly desires. I mean, it ought to be vexing to you if you're a believer, right? It should vex your spirit or your soul that your flesh wants to do various sins, right? And I believe if you're saved, it will. But again, that's not something that is an outward manifestation that other people can see what's going on internally, which is why we don't use that and say, oh, well, and, you know, there are points where you can get to where you stop thinking about sins, by the way. You can be vexed for a while, but you can quench the Spirit. This is why the Bible says quench not the Spirit. The Spirit is there to help guide you in all truth and, and, and to guide you in the right way. But if you keep choosing, for example, and again, I know this firsthand, if you keep choosing to just choose alcohol, choose alcohol, choose alcohol, and you just do this every day, that vexation of the Spirit, you can quench that. You can, you can get that to, to die down because you're going to be strengthening your flesh and walking more in the, in the flesh and your spirit's going to be very weak and not going to be bothering you as much. I mean, if, when you're walking in spirit for a long time, you get into even the smallest of sins, hopefully it's vexing your soul like really bad. But you can choose and continue to walk in the flesh and start quenching that spirit down. And, you know, God help you if you, really, if you do quench the spirit because that's what's going to be keeping you and, you know, getting you feeling guilty and everything else to getting back right with God. But it is possible. But um, so w while we're in this body, I, I'm kind of getting sidetracked here. You know, we're absent from the Lord. We, it's much better to be present with God, our spirit to be with God and not to be in this body. But he says, wherefore we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ that everyone may receive the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. So there is a judgment seat of Christ that's coming. And that's why I wanted you to turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 because we're going to see a glimpse of this. We're going to receive for what's on our body, but this has nothing to do with being saved. The judgment seat of Christ only is for believers. It's only for people who are already saved. It's where God judges your works that you've done. The great, don't confuse the judgment seat of Christ with the great white throne judgment in Revelation chapter 20 because that's where the dead stand before God at the great white throne, and the dead are judged, the dead that come up out of hell, the dead that, that stand before God because they don't have eternal life. They're considered dead. They're judged according to their works and thrown in the lake of fire. The judgment seat of Christ is for believers where your works are judged before God because guess what? God does reward you for the good works that you do. Right. But we're going to see here, again, one more final proof that it is possible for a believer, for someone who's saved, to not have the good works to show for it. At the judgment seat of Christ, this is going to happen. Look at verse number 11. The Bible says, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So you have to have the foundation, Jesus Christ, your salvation, right? On that foundation you build. You build your house, you build your building, you build your works, you put your works on that foundation. And how we build on that is how we receive rewards or not. Verse number 12, now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, all three of those things are things that are, that are lasting, they're enduring in the sense that you can try them with fire and they don't burn up, they don't disintegrate, you know, they're still there. Gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. So are saying if you've done work that abides the testing, the trying, God really putting your work to the test of was it valuable? 
Did you do work for the Lord on this, in this life? Now, you can do things with your life. We all do things, right? We spend our time doing something. All of the works that you do is going to come before God. You can do things even that aren't sinful. For example, build a great business. You could be the founder of Walmart or Amazon or whatever, right? something that has huge impact on all kinds of people, and I'm offering great products at a cheap price. I'm doing all these things that, that are useful to people. But God doesn't care about those things because those are all physical, tangible things that are going to burn up. They don't matter to God. So you can be a success in this life even by doing things that are not wicked and still have that work burned up before God because to God that doesn't matter. The things that matter to God is what's going to abide. Souls that you reach, people's lives that you change, influences people, you know, living for God, helping, just, just edifying and encouraging someone to get, to get out of their sin and start living for God, you know, some believer, that's going to be worthy of a reward because now you're helping someone else to do work for the Lord. Amen. Just winning a soul to Christ, saving a soul from the, the, the pit of hell. Hey, that lasts forever. That's eternal. That has good value. Those things are going to be rewarded, but other stuff, it's going to burn up. And that's why it says there in verse number 15, if any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. Why does he suffer loss? Because all that stuff he worked for is gone. That's his loss. He's like, I've, I've worked my whole life for all this stuff and it's gone. Ceases to exist. That's a loss. You've wasted all that time and energy and effort on something that's just gone. But he himself shall be saved, yet so is by fire. But he's still saved. Why? Because he had the foundation. He decided to build a stupid house on top of that foundation. But you know what? The foundation still remains. Jesus Christ is still there. Everything he built on there is gone. But you know what? He's still, he's still saved. He still inherits the kingdom of God. Amen. The rewards aren't there. So we have examples of people who don't do the work. But the Bible clearly says, says that they're saved. We don't have to look at the works to know if someone's saved. We look to the heart the best that we can. Since we, can't, we don't have the x-ray eyes to see the heart, we use the words, the conversation, the, the, the questions. And we go beyond just asking someone, do you believe in Jesus? The majority of Americans will tell you they believe in Jesus. But that doesn't mean that they're only trusting in him for their eternal salvation. People that tell you they believe in Jesus will also tell you, oh, well, if I don't do what's right and don't follow the law, then I'm going to hell. And that shows you that they're not trusting completely in Jesus. So we ask the right question. Again, that's kind of the, the topic for another sermon. I've got more notes here. I was going to go through a couple examples. We've got examples from the Bible of men that you can look at their outward appearance and say they're probably not saved. King Saul is probably the best example of that. And I have all the scripture references here. We, we kind of ran out of time. I don't want to belabor the point either. But King Saul, he, kill, he, he ordered the killing of 85 priests of the Lord. He consulted with a witch which the Bible says the witches ought to be put to death. He had gotten the witches out of the land and made it illegal and then went and consulted a witch. Okay, but prior to that, he was given a new heart. The Bible says he was, he was a new man. He, was, he prophesied with the prophets. And then when he did conjure up the witch, when he did talk to the witch, and he, she, you know, he wanted her to use a familiar spirit to bring up Samuel the prophet, the narrator of the Bible itself even says that it was Samuel speaking to him. It was not just some phony thing. It was not the witch speaking to him. It was Samuel that he was having a conversation with. And Samuel said that this day, he says that him and his son, Saul and his sons, were going to be with Samuel. And if we have any idea if Samuel was saved, I mean, good luck telling me Samuel was not saved. Saul was going to be with Samuel when he died in that battle. If Saul was not saved, Samuel could not say, you're going to be with me because he wouldn't be with him. Saul was saved. King Saul was saved. King Solomon was saved, even though his wives turned his heart away from the Lord. He turned away from God and built altars up to false gods. You're going to tell me the, the, 
the co-author, if you will, of, of Proverbs, Song of Solomon, was not even saved. I have a hard time buying that because the Bible says that holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Amen. He was a holy man of God that got into a lot of sin and ended up turning his back on God. He was a saved man. If you looked at his works at the end of his life even, he was, oh, you got to endure to the end to be saved. No, that's not, that's talking about your flesh. Again, get it in context. You read Matthew 24, it's not talking about your eternal salvation. So hopefully this clears things up if there's any little bit of confusion because people will throw that out there and say, oh, well, you, you know, if you're not having good works, you're not saved. Works don't prove your salvation. Faith does what you believe does. It's about right to have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for the clear instruction from your word. God, I pray that you please help us to be diligent to be reading our Bibles on our own regularly and just often, dear Lord, that... Um, we can know what your words say for ourselves. Help us to be guarded against those that would pervert the gospel and those that, that preach falsely, dear Lord. Help us to be able to identify the false prophets by looking at their fruit, by doing a fruit inspection on the false prophets to see what their, their followers believe, what type of fruit they're bringing forth, dear Lord, and to identify the false prophet or the wolf that's dressed up in sheep's clothing, dear Lord. I pray that you please help us to have that wisdom um, Lord, and, and I pray that you please use our church to, to lead a lot of people to Christ and to show them how the free gift of salvation and, and how much you love them and, and want them to be saved, dear God. So in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, let's turn to one last song before we're dismissed. Song number 143, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. Song 143, We Have Assurance. God's Word says it's eternal. God's Word says it's everlasting, and I believe that. <laughs>